And I want to praise God for the opportunity to be in worship this morning. And I uh, just want to praise God for His glory showing up in our lives, His power, His strength. Hey, Joe, could you grab that? And I just want to celebrate uh, the community that it takes to be the community. Um, I'm Pastor Jason and a lead pastor here at Horizons and uh, just thrilled to be able to serve you as your pastor today. Um, pastor John's with us and uh, right there and he serves so bravely. Uh, Fusion and uh, just and prays for a lot of you and visits for a lot of you and oh, what an extraordinary team, all the staff and people that are here. And so I just want to welcome you. If you are our guest this morning, I want you to know that we are just gonzo about you. We're so excited that you're here and because uh, that's what we love. We love every morning that we get a worship that God's doing something big, doing something new, and you're a part of it. Um, so we want to welcome you and uh, also just want to celebrate for us who are Horizons. Um, it's a good day to be alive. It's a good day to be in God's presence because we are life-changed life changers. So what that means is as we seek Jesus, as we seek a relationship with him, and we seek a relationship with other Christ followers coming together in, 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 our, in worship and in life groups as a community, that he begins to change our lives, our directions, our values, where we point, how we care about the world, what we're doing as a, to, a part of it, and then we become life changers as we step into new roles or new opportunities and let what Christ is doing in the center of our hearts flow out of us to be a part of change for other people. So speaking of life changed life changers, um, I brought a special guest up here this morning. Uh, <laughs> now, if you are our guest this morning, this is my wife, Sarah. And uh, so every once in a while, we get to ask her to say something really important that I could never convey so well. So um, she's going to tell you a little bit what it means an opportunity to be life changers in a way that, uh, that will change your life completely. Sarah? Um, I wanted to come up this morning and talk briefly about the Project Hope mission trip that's coming up. It's coming up in March. Um, I believe it's over spring break this year. It's the 12th through the 24th. Um, and I mostly wanted to share today a little bit about what we do over at the mission trip um, or the vision trip. Um, I've had a lot of people asking questions about Project Hope and about the vision trip and what we do. and. Uh, all sorts of questions, and I, I would have to talk for a couple hours up here to, to tell you everything. So I'll be back at the Mission and Outreach counter, which is across from where you get your coffee and donuts um, after service, and I'd be happy to answer all your questions about Project Hope, what's going on in India, what we're doing, what they're doing, uh, what the vision trip is like. Um, but today I'd like to just answer a couple of the most frequently asked questions I get. Uh, the first is probably, do you think I can do it? And the answer is yes. Uh, we loved it. it. Talk about life change on both ends. It's just incredible. I could spout on forever and ever about it, but I will spare you that today. But yes, you can do it. And if you have specific concerns, just come ask me after service. Um, the other most frequent question I get is, what do we do over there? What are you doing when you go on the vision trip over there? And um, it's not like a typical mission trip that you might think of. We aren't going over there to build something. We aren't going over there to um, find kids in the street and feed them for a week or give them work for a week. Before you go over on the vision trip, Allie will take you through a really great study called um, Helping Without Hurting. And it's talking about helping other cultures that we don't know much about in a way that is sustainable and will last and is um, helping to break the cycles of poverty over there. So when we go over there, we are supporting groups that are already in place to help break the cycle of poverty by helping kids get education, by feeding them and raising them in a safe environment. We are visiting groups that are already in place to help break the cycle of prostitution and the sex trade by getting young girls off the streets. Those places are already in place over there, doing amazing work in their culture, in the environment they understand. They're the ones that we need to be supporting. So there's Prathiksha and Bethel, two children's homes. And when you go over there, the biggest thing you do in a word is uh, relationship. You are spending time with the directors, hearing their hearts, 
their broken hearts, their joyful hearts. You're eating a lot of food. <laughs> you are uh, having a lot of tea with people. You're meeting new people, going into people's homes. Um, you're just there to physically encourage and support the people that we support financially from over here. Um, so hopefully that all makes sense. Um, we, we loved being over there, meeting Sister Jessie and Sister Molly and meeting Susma and Pravin who work every day to help these children and to feed them and teach them about Christ was incredible. So like I said, I will be out there after the service if you have any questions. Um, again, it's March 12th through the 24th and um, there's a $250 deposit due by September 25th. And Ali wants uh, 18 years or older, or if you're still a student in high school, to go with a parent. So any other technical questions like that, I can answer afterwards. So can we say a quick prayer, real quick? Okay, let's say a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you will fill the hearts of everyone here today, and that if going on the vision trip is something you wish for them, that they will feel burdened by that, and that they will pursue it, um, and otherwise, if not, that they will share their resources with this incredible mission um, on this side of things, Lord. Thank you, in your son's name, amen. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. And uh, this really is a, a chance of a lifetime. Um, a, the trip is affordable. B, um, it's not a tour trip, so you're going to be face-to-face -face and even like quarters, living space to living space, with real people that are just getting through their daily lives. You get to see one of the most authentic insights of these places. And again, to let your heart pour out uh, onto these people, it's extraordinary. So I wanna encourage you, you're terrified or uh, the m money's an issue or whatever it is, talk to Sarah, talk to Allie and Anthony. Um, it, this is possible, and again, it's a chance of a lifetime. So again, want to welcome you this morning uh, at Horizons as we grow or as we move through our lives in pursuit of God, we do three things. We connect, and that's with Christ, with each other, and worshiping in life groups. We grow together, we dig deep, we seek his word, we learn to pray, we learn to um, really have a, a living relationship with God, and then we take that chance to lead, and that's putting all of that stuff in motion that we're becoming disciples today that we read about in the, in, in, in the Gospels, we get to be those things. We're actually called to be those things. So today, it makes sense um, as we connect, grow, and lead that we are in First Timothy. We've continued into our second um, part of the study here in Second Timoth or First Timothy and uh, really learning to be Christ's people in the world today. Now I want you to think about this for a second because so many times today, the church has a reputation um, of being uh, just, just judgmental or irrelevant, like talking about things that don't really matter or superficial, like pretending that everything's fine um, while everything underneath is, is not going very well. Uh, really exclusive, saying I'm in this circle and, if, and you're not, so therefore I'm better than you. Or even it really inflexible, so, you know, unwilling to consider anyone else's viewpoints or, 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 uh, or, um, or points in life at all. So that's the reputation the church has. And so sometimes when society at large hears the mention of the church or thinks about church, they, we, they kind of shrug their shoulders or exasperate and say, gosh, you know, the church. But wouldn't it be better, I don't know about you, I'd love to have a reputation of the church being the most prized possession or the most prized entity of our nation. Where people say, thank goodness the church exists. Where would we be without the church, without these folks? That's where we want to be. Now, we don't get there, though, if we don't grow. If we just stay surface-level Christians who are just seeking to satisfy our own needs and, and heal our own brokenness, if we're just there, then we don't move past that superficiality that, that the rest of this, the world's seeing. So we're growing. We're taking a chance to dig deep and his lessons to let him transform us at the core of who we are. So that's what First Timothy, that Paul's letter, is really doing in our lives, and that we get to be this powerful church that, uh, that reflects the truth of who Christ is in this life-giving, um, society-protecting and, and building way. And so uh, I just want to encourage you to, to keep that in mind as we dig into First Timothy here, that we're, we're doing big things.
I want to remind you the program that you received as you entered into the worship service this morning. On the back side of that, there's a uh, worship outline. That's an opportunity for you to follow along, just to take some notes or fill in some blanks, or even your own reflections as we go through the teaching this morning. Also want to remind you that God doesn't speak to us just one hour on Sunday. So that program is probably one of your greatest accesses to what God has said through his word today that you can look back to and refer back to throughout the entire week. So I want to encourage you to take that with you. Uh, there's also a passport uh, to all the ministries here of all the things that are going on. So uh, let that be a tool, a, a resource for you this morning. So last week we talked about resisting easy. And the basic point that we unpacked is that in response to a situation or a need, usually the easiest thing or the cheapest thing or the quickest thing is probably not the best or, or, or uh, most reliable thing. Oftentimes the quickest, the shortest, the cheapest is the, uh, ultimately the most unreliable or the most dangerous so we talked about resisting easy. This week we're going to talk about um, maybe not quite of a, a, as a luring topic, but trust me, this is deep. We're talking about being Christians and leading with integrity. Being Christians and leading integ- and with integrity. Essentially being Christ's representatives in a way that really propels the things, the truths, the foundations of Christ into the world. Instead of um, being uh, a Christian who, you know, who believes in Jesus, believes in the resurrection and, and has surrendered his or her life and yet being sort of mute in the world, being mute in, in different um, arenas or situations and uh, really not having a voice or a way to, to share that or let that to be powerful through you. So we're talking about really living that example. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn to 1 Timothy here. Now, I want to remind you, this is Paul's letter to Timothy, who's this young little pastor guy in, in Ephesus, and, uh, and Timothy barely knows what's going on, and Paul's just saying, no, I want to pour my heart into you. So I want to remind you, um, as we dig into 1 Timothy, I want you to be here to see God's word in front of you. So you get out your phone, you can follow along on your Bible app, um, your Bible too as well. If you don't have a Bible this morning, grab one of the Bibles on this little table as you exit the worship center this morning. Write your name in that Bible because it's yours. It's not a, it's not a pew Bible that you grab and put back. It's yours. It's yours because we want God's word to work its way from your hand to the center of our hearts. So 1 Timothy is one of the later books in the Bible. This is, uh, again, a letter from Paul, uh, really instructions to the church. We're going to begin in verse 17 this morning of chapter 5. Verse 17 of chapter 5. And um, it just, again, like I said last Sunday, hold on here. Just hear what's going on and let some wonder kind of come up in your heart about where we're going with this this morning. Because God's, this is living word, friends. This is the word that speaks to us anew because it's alive Every time we read it, it's not the same ever. That's the power of God's living word. It's not just words on a page that were written 2,000 years ago. It's now. It's being spoken. It's being brought into life today. Paul says to Timothy, elders who lead in the church, who lead well, should be paid double, especially those who work with public speaking and public teaching. Right? <laughs> Sweet. Well, it's called good. <laughs> You're dismissed. <laughs> okay, so, okay, hold on. Keep going. Okay, I just told you to keep going, so keep going with me. Verse 18, the scripture says, don't muzzle an ox while he's treading, while he's treading grain. Workers deserve their pay. Okay, so that's, that's lesson number one. Paul goes on, verse 19, don't an, accept an accusation made against an elder unless it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. Okay, so that's point number two that Paul's making here. Point number three, verse 20. Discipline those who are sinning in front of everyone so that all others will be afraid. Okay, that's point number three. Keep with me here. There's there's some really powerful stuff in here. Number four, verse 21. I charge you before God in Christ Jesus and the elect angels to follow these practices without bias, without playing favorites. Don't rush into commission anyone into leadership and don't participate in the sins of others keep yourself morally pure long list man paul's just laying it in on timothy 
Then he says, verse 23, you're all going to love this and hope I just go here the whole time. Don't drink water anymore, Paul says to Timothy. A little wine because of your stomach, because of the problems of your frequent illnesses. Okay, so he's saying drink wine instead of water, Paul, or Timothy. And then finally he says, verse 24, the sins of some people are obvious and the sins are judged before people must be faced, must face judgment. But the sins of other people show up later. In the same way, the good that people do is also obvious and can't be hidden. Okay, so last week we talked about widows and as we were hearing God's word, we were all sitting here thinking, how do I apply this to what's going on in my life right now? Okay, so today you're hearing about uh, the treatment of elders in the church and you're, you're saying, okay, I know this applies to someone, but how does it apply to us, right? Like you're thinking, well, okay, well, this probably is good literature for the bishop to read or maybe the SPRC, that's our HR branch here, our HR team at the church, or maybe the steering team, you know, they're the ones directing the church. They're the ones that need to be reading this, but how do I take this home? How does this apply to me today? Now, here's the thing. It's not always about you. That's, one, that's lesson number one, right? Uh, God did not write this whole thing just to say, well, I want to make this person feel better. God wrote and spoke his word into place so that it leads us closer to him because regardless of what's going on in our lives, that's where that unity is life-giving, okay? So it's not just about what's going on, but second of all, what God is saying applies in so many powerful ways. What, all we need to do is just kind of unpack it together. So we're going to go there this morning. So uh, just this last Tuesday, I was having a, a conversation with a professor friend of mine. Um, he's teaching um, a lot of intro classes at Nebraska Wesleyan, and uh, this is his first year, so he's got a lot of first, um, kind of first-year perspective. And he was telling me, he said, Jason, it blows my mind. He had a, uh, an assignment where the students were to read, these are incoming freshmen, um, to read two books, okay, short excerpts from those books, and then um, provide, not, not a book review, right, um, but to provide thoughts um, about how these two um, readings are similar and how they're different and, uh, and, and some conclusions based on that. So that was the assignment. And he said, Jason, 90% of my students failed this assignment because they failed to engage in critical thinking. In other words, they failed to engage in critical thinking that took them beyond book reports into the realm of a unique, original, and founded thought or opinion. 90% of his incoming class failed it. This thing called critical thinking is essentially looking beyond face value, like taking scripture or taking uh, what's going on, messages in our world, and going beyond face value. Analyzing a little bit, assessing a couple things, and saying, what am I actually hearing? What's the intention behind it? What's going on here? Comparing and contrasting similar data, experiences, situations, or other research in the world, if you want to get really into it. In the effort to make a more informed, rational decision or conclusion. Okay, that's essentially what critical thinking is. But what is true is that um, while that sounds like a really boring definition, friends, if we're not doing that in our world, if we're not engaging in critical thinking, then we are essentially walking around like blind sheep. Now Jesus, we read a scripture last week, Jesus had a lot of pity for the blind leading the blind and the sheep that were, that were just all over the place, had no leader, had no ability to make these uh, decisions for themselves. That's a scary thought, that 90% of our upcoming freshmen, our upcoming classes, um, it, either don't or don't have the capacity to think critically or are not used to doing that. You see, this thinking critically thing applies to all sorts of arenas today. It's, we're in an election season. Friend, if we are not thinking critically, if we are not looking at the situations and the agendas and the messages and the, spons and the, and the, and the opinions and all of these things, if we're not thinking critically about them, if we're just taking them face value, we are in trouble, okay? Leadership at work. Without some sort of critical thought, our leadership at work absolutely crumbles. Our decisions at home, when we have to make decisions about finances, raising kids, or making life choices, if we're not stepping into a deeper discernment about where we're going and how we're doing things, we are in trouble. If we cannot think critically in regard to marketing schemes, media schemes, wealth and health schemes, 
we are in trouble in our faith if we are not able to engage in a deeper level to go a little bit deeper we're in trouble and that's where we see the church has a reputation that's where we see then that the church seems irrelevant because we're just we're just following along otherwise but that's what the heart of God of Paul's words are today. You see, God desires us to be leaders. I'm not just making that up because it's a fancy ending to a three-part growth model for Horizons Community Church. It's disciples. The disciples, they follow Jesus, but in their following Jesus, Jesus said, I'm sending you out. Go and be leaders. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Jesus did not say, I'm sending you out like armored vehicles amongst, passenger, amongst pedestrians. He says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, Jesus says, be as wise, or as some translations say, as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Jesus wants us to be leaders in our communities, not followers, not mindless marching people to the beat of someone else's drum, to be intentional about who we are, what we believe, and how we choose to follow Christ in the choosing of our decisions. God doesn't want lemmings. He doesn't want us just to be doing what someone with authority or power is saying. He doesn't want us to be doing just something that seems really alluring or convincing to us. God doesn't want us to be doing something just because we see someone that we want to be more like doing that. God wants us to be leaders with critical thought and and integrity in the things that we're doing. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17 tells us Finally, test everything and hold fast to what is good. That's God speaking through Paul saying, don't just be the blind leading the blind or following the blind. Test everything. Dig into it. God wants us to be leaders. It's very needed. It's needed if we're gonna if we're gonna read, lead children to be the next generation church. It's needed if we're going to reach, cultivate, and equip people to mature in the Holy Spirit. It's needed if we want to be life changed, life changers. If we want to um, bring people to following Jesus Christ to transform the world, all of that is absolutely essential. So here's what's going on at the depth of Paul's words. Again, this is not just about elders. I want you to hear the first thing that Paul says is support what is good. Second thing he says is to defend what you support. Now, we're going to dig into this here. So the third thing, he says, walk closely with what you defend. And the fourth thing he says is, don't just rush in to make decisions. Don't just rush in to appoint other leaders. Deep discernment. Take a moment. This, see, I'm using critical thought, but essentially that is deep discernment. That's prayer. That's, that's, that's asking God. That's digging deeper, taking a moment to ask a question rather than to respond. So here's the first thing. Right? Verse 17, our favorite, favorite verse in the entire First Timothy scripture. Elders who lead well should be paid double, especially those who work with public speaking and teaching. That's our favorite one, right? Okay, so... so Okay, what we know is that Paul is saying to Timothy in the church, if there are people who are leading well and they're doing their jobs well, support them. Take care of them. Honor their needs. Make sure they have what they need. Scripture says, Paul, Paul says that Scripture says that don't muzzle an ox while it's treading the oats. In other words, if the ox is doing a lot of work and a lot of really important things, don't starve it. Feed it, fuel that animal so it can do the work that it's provided. Now, I'm not relating any of us staff as oxes, but, but Paul did apparently. <laughs> but it's important, even in our ministry, to take care of our staff. Now, I shared a letter with you, uh, I think that was about middle of summer. My, one of my dreams is to make sure that all of our staff are actually taken care of in regard to like, like benefits for health, things like that. Like We currently don't offer any sort of package for our staff for like that. I would love to be able to take care of our staff in that way, and I think that's what Paul and God ultimately is teaching. So that's a good thing. But here's another thing that, that takes us a little bit deeper, okay? So this is part of your takeaway this morning in addition to what we're doing here at Horizons as the body of church, or the body of Christ, the church. Paul's also saying, 
if there's something that's doing good in your community, in your family, in your nation, in your world, if there are things that are truly oriented towards doing good, that at the end of the day you can say, I know that my child or I know that I or I know that my family or I know that my neighborhood is going in the right direction and becoming more Christ-like or, or uh, active citizens in our community, if there is something that is propelling that is something good, and Paul's saying, support it. Pour into it. Because we don't always do this, do we? We don't, always, we don't always pour into things that are actually providing the most good in our society. Because you know, you know who we like to pay well? We like to pay athletes really well. We like to pay actors really well. Pop stars. CEOs. We love to pay them well. But I, I mean, okay, and I'm speaking in big terms here, so I know we can have a, longer, a bigger conversation about this, but um, tell me exactly how your child is going to develop and benefit well by paying an athlete millions of dollars a year. Help point that out to me, okay? How's that going to work? But we pour money into these things. What about, what about all the other things? Shopping malls? We love pouring money into those things. Casinos? Amusement parks, restaurants, arenas, cell phones, f- tickets to b- football games. We love pouring money into those things. Now, I'm, I'm speaking in big pictures, but tell me again. How do those things assure that your marriage is going to stay healthy and honor God? How does that assure us that we're taking care of those who, uh, who, who need someone to walk with them? How does that assure that we are living by Christ's values in our world? Okay, I know I'm, 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 I'm speaking right here. This is a ledge right here. But the question I want to invite you to ask yourself, this is on your worship outline this morning, is what truly has the greatest potential to shape positively our society, our children, our faith, our future, and our ideals? Are you pouring into that? Are you supporting it? I know, we're, we're getting right here, and I know that this is a big overview, and, and we can have a deeper conversation about, you, you could show me how some of these things, pouring into them actually does affect society positively. But regardless, I want you, regardless if you're convinced on something, I want you to continue to ask yourself, how am I supporting what's truly doing good in our world? Okay, so I told you, Paul, Paul wrote this, and then God's saying, let's go deeper. Verse 19, don't accept an accusation made against an elder unless it is confirmed by three, two or three witnesses. Support or defend what you support. So if there's something good and you are supporting it, then the next thing is to defend it. Because how often in our world do we end up seeming like a little bit fickle in our decisions or our opinions? How often do we end up being just a little bit easily persuaded when it comes to our decisions and our values? We say we're going to purchase, we're not going to make a purchase at a store. We go to the store, there's some really awesome sale, and we end up taking home two. Our opinions about our presidential candidates and other people that we are electing for offices, okay? How many times is our decision or our opinion of who's the better candidate or who, what, what's the better way to go, how many times does that change depending on who you talk to throughout the day? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, th- there's, this candidate's got good stuff, and this candidate's got good stuff, and then I just heard this, and so I really don't like that candidate. But, but then I you know, later had this conversation, and they showed some light on that. And Paul is saying, support what's good, and then if it's, if it's something that you support, defend it. Stand up for it. Hold on to it. The assurance of Jesus and God's faithfulness, hold on to it. Paul, uh, excuse me, the writer to the Hebrew community in Hebrews chapter 13, 9, it says, don't be mistaken or misled by the many strange teachings out there. It's a good thing for the heart to be strengthened by grace rather than food. Now, that may seem like a bizarre thing to say, to be strengthened by grace rather than food, but essentially what, what pleases us, what makes us full or satisfied is sometimes the very thing that we'll suddenly start following after. And Paul's saying, uh-uh, Focus on the grace of Jesus Christ, not on what's going to fill your belly. Because what God is doing to provide in your lives comes from a source of truth. 
Food comes from a place of taking care of one's needs or desires for the moment. Furthermore, Colossians chapter 2, Paul's writing to the church in Colossae, again, giving all these instructions. Verse 8, chapter 2 says, See to it that nobody enslaves you with philosophies and foolish deception, which conform to human traditions and the way the world thinks and acts rather than the way Christ thinks and acts. You see what's going on here? Paul is saying before, because essentially what, what Paul says in the scripture is before you accept an accusation made to an elder, better talk to some more people. Make sure this thing is true before you just start following someone's accusation. See, now we're tying back to what God expects of us as leaders to be in critical thought, not just to take something at face value, but to look into it. Again, just like Paul wrote to the church in in Colossae, the church, the Hebrew community, what we are to do is, is not just fall into something. Lesson number three, this is verse 20, number 20 here. This is what Paul is also saying. He's saying first, support what's good, defend what you support, and then third, walk closely with what you defend. Friends, it's all about accountability. Paul is teaching about accountability, right? That's keeping others accountable to what they say they are going to do or not do, right? Nobody in this room likes accountability, if you raise your hand, I'll have you come up here and preach next Sunday's sermon, okay? Uh, actually, because that'd be awesome, okay? We don't, we have, uh, accountability is not always fun. Nobody likes to be nagged, hey, did you do that? Hey, did you stay away from that? Hey, I haven't seen you doing this recently. Are you okay? Nobody likes that necessarily, but it's powerful. It is always good to have accountability partners. Friends, there's a, there's, that's one reason why we invite you to be part of a life group. Not just so you can have social outings and, and have dinner with someone and, you know, and talk about some, you know, the things going on in your life. To hold each other accountable. To walk with each other. To, to continue to go in the right direction. I cannot, so this is kind of funny. I turned 36 a couple weeks ago. And since I've turned 36, I've, I've like had two runs. You know, I'm like supposed to be Mr. Marathon guy, you know, 11 minutes away from qualifying for Boston. And I ran two times since I turned 36. And every morning I would, at 4.45 in the morning, I'd be like, oh. So I'd text my team and I'd be like, I'm out. Sorry, guys. And everyone was like, oh, you know, it's okay. We get it. We get it. You know, you're going to be a dad now and that's cool. And, um, because Sarah's probably, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and finally though, um, after several times, uh, I was like, ah, oh, you know, I'll try to be there tomorrow. And one of the guys who actually, now is going to Horizons here, um, texted back to the whole group and, and said, you're going to try to be there tomorrow? He said, you've been so flaky recently. What's going on? In front of the whole text group. <laughs> right? And, I mean, this is as I'm getting ready to preach this message. This happened just this week. And I had this first moment, this little flinch, like, how dare he? And then, and then like, oh, thank God, the Holy Spirit's, like, real close. We try to cultivate that all the time, every morning. Me and the Holy Spirit, I'm like, come on, come on. And, and the Holy Spirit, I feel like the Holy Spirit was like, this is what you needed. So I responded to him and the whole group, and I said, thank you for holding me accountable. And I showed up the next morning, and it was horrible. <laughs> but I made it. And then I showed up the next day and it wasn't as bad. You see, accountability, I mean, that's just a, that's a meaningless thing like trying to be a good marathon runner. But accountability in our lives when it comes to protecting our family, protecting our health, protecting, uh, protecting our faith and the direction we want to go, being true to the nation that we support because of, of what God has given us, it's about accountability. It's about walking with each other. Friends, nothing in this world is perfect except God himself, Okay. So it makes sense that accountability is a part of anything that's not perfect. So that way, along the way, we have some checks and some bounces and some ways to keep it pointed to Christ along the way. If something is out of whack, whether it's in your life or it's a statement that you support or someone that you are with or supporting, if something's out of whack and you refuse to hold it accountable, that is your own personal first step towards your own downfall of your integrity, Okay? Accountable, accountability is not just keeping after other people. It's maintaining your own integrity as well. 
something or someone has fault, something you believe, or your own personal activities, or, or you, you know, you're, you're falling off the bandwagon, um, so to speak, own it, reflect on it, pray about it, and re- redirect. Redirect. Take that accountability and say, thank you. Give that accountability and say, I'm doing this because I care about you, and I'm, doing about, I'm, I'm not trying to be a jerk. We're going in the right direction. Let's just recalibrate a little bit. Number four, Paul says, don't be rash. He says, don't appoint leaders really quick. Now, this is verse 22. Don't rush to commission anyone into leadership. He's saying, essentially, don't rush. Friends, some of the best advice I've ever heard. This comes from Financial Peace University. Um, We're talking about spending money, making wise decisions, not getting caught up in impulse buys. Dave Ramsey, and I believe Scripture is saying this just as well, says don't rush into it. Instead, if you want something or you want to go in a certain direction, sleep on it. Go to sleep. Let your tired, hurried, worried brain rest and then wake up in the morning and see if that's still the decision that you need to make. Sleep on it. Pray about it. Go to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I'm about ready to make a decision that I could potentially be really stupid. Will you please help me see if it is or not? <laughs> By the way, God loves it when you just use your words and talk to him like you would someone else. Okay? Sleep on it. Or talk to someone who you know is going to be absolutely honest and unbiased to you. And tell them, I'm telling you this because I want your honest advice, not because I want you to tell you, I want you to tell me what I want to hear. I want you to put it to me directly. Sleep on it. Don't rush. Making decisions that matter should not be rushed into because so many times you wake up in the morning and you think, yeah, good thing I didn't do that. Or how about those emails? Mm, someone just said something and you want to mm, reply right back to them? And right there, you know, you go, like, like suddenly you're like typomatic, like 500 words a minute, and you're just like, send, take that, sleep on it, or walk away, okay? Go get a drink of water, pray about it, and see if that email is still worth sending, okay? This is Paul's words, okay? <laughs> They're good, aren't they? See how deep he's taken us? But friends, let's go a little bit deeper. This is the gospel, okay? This isn't just good advice. This isn't like Dr. Jason on Sunday mornings, okay? This is God's living word, and it always, always, always ties back to the gospel. See, I think we underestimate Jesus' teaching. Never mistake my words. The, resurre- the crucifixion, the sacrifice Jesus made, the resurrection, the, the, the overcoming death, and bearing all of our sins that we might have eternal life. Nothing is more crucial and vital to what Jesus did for us. However, I think we underestimate the example that Jesus gave us on how powerful that is every moment for every day. Because who in his life lived more perfectly into what Paul has just taught us than Jesus Christ? to support what is good, to defend what he supported, to walk closely with what he defended, and not to rush into making decisions. Jesus Christ. Now I want you to turn to Hebrews with me here. Hebrews is even farther back than 1 Timothy, but don't go too fast because you'll miss it. Hebrews is right, uh, it was right before James and before that lineup, before we get to Revelation. So it's towards the back of your Bible here. This is what, chapter 3, This is what the writer to the Hebrew community, we're not exactly sure who it is. It kind of sounds like Paul, but it's not Paul enough to call it Paul's words here. This voice to the community of the Hebrew people. Talking about who Jesus is from a very priestly, from a very uh, very Jewish way of understanding who Jesus is, says this about Jesus. See if you can pick out where what Paul is teaching falls exactly in line with what Jesus did. Therefore, brothers and sisters who are partners in the heavenly calling, think about Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Jesus was faithful to the ones appointed to him. Right there, Jesus was a Christian leader with integrity, supporting what was good, defending what he supported, walking closely with them. See, Moses was faithful in God's house, but, the, but he deserves greater, Jesus deserves greater glory than Moses in the same way that the builder of the house deserves more honor than the house itself. Every builder, every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was the faithful 
in all of God's house as a servant in order to affirm the things that would be spoken later. But Jesus was faithful over God's house as a son. We are his house if we hold on to the confidence and the pride that our hope gives us. Pride in who God is for his glory, not pride in who we are because of what we've done. Do you see what's going on in there? Jesus lived 100% into this. He was the builder of the house. He poured into what was good. He defended it. He stayed true. He was, to, he was poised with the moment of decision saying, do I take care of my selfish needs or do I offer this sacrifice, my life, for all of those people? Whether they want it, get it, receive it, or even understand it. What do I do here? And Jesus says, I will live into this example. Friends, my greatest prayer for us as a community, for every single one of you, you may be a guest today and you are part of this body right here, right now, so I'm talking to you specifically. My greatest prayer for this community is that we, uh, that we absolutely desire more than anything growing in Christ and bringing Christ into the world. That our greatest possessions, our greatest seekings, Our greatest goal is that we come to believe and hope in him who is the best thing in this world. Friends, there are so many things in this world that we believe are are going to make us happy or make us successful or make us feel satisfied and, and worthy in this world. But my hope and my prayer is that as we learn and grow together, that you will see that your greatest pursuit is Jesus Christ in your life and to be able to share him that all else stands or falls off of that foundation. That's my prayer. And we get there through walking along these holy words that are given to us this morning. Let us pray.